Hello, Mike, again. Hello, Peter. Thank so you. We've, um, we, we've, we've talked about the National and your time at the National, and then we had a, a, a quite a big diversion into, <laughs> into the musical that almost, well, did make it to the West End. Um, <laughs> But what, um, what amazed me, because there was a moment when you were talking about that, and I thought, well, what on earth has that got to do with the National? And what was so amazing was that you actually linked it up at the end, and you said it's about kind of learning, yeah. you know, it, um, the stuff that goes well and the stuff that doesn't necessarily always go well. And right. Yes, because when things go well, that's what you want to hear. So you often deny the truths that you know are there, You because you know... The, better than anybody, whether a show is any good or not, in your heart of hearts. And, uh, but you, when you're praised, you don't often feel the need to investigate. When, you're, when you get bad reviews or you have failures, you go through this series of uh, sequences. It's a bit like mourning. Do you know what I mean? You, yeah. First of all, you're, you're very indignant, ang angry and total denial. Then you're very self-pitying. And then gradually you think, oh, that, that they were right about that, or that made sense. And what's interesting, ch chancing on old reviews or looking at old reviews from a long time ago, which you thought were terrible, they were actually perfectly good reviews, except there was just one sentence that was critical, and your whole soul and being had focused on that, and that's all you got out of it. You know, it's this outrageous need to, to be perfect. <laughs> you know, and you go, and you think, oh, actually, why was I so upset? That was quite a good review. I used to, tr with trembling, go out, you know, buy the papers the day after the re reviews came out, and remember my hand shaking, open the page, and my eye always focused on the, the critical line. <laughs> anyway, there we go. Um. All right, so you, you're now cuddling off to Canada, apparently. Yes. Well, I, I did, a, I, I did, in the middle of, you know, in between lots of productions for shared experience, I did work a, abroad quite a lot, and we can talk about all that quite separately in a way, because working in other countries, again, was very revealing in the sense of how you thought things should be, uh, making false assumptions about how poor people thought and functioned and so forth and so on and learning a huge amount about other nations because other cultures because when you work with an actor it's so obvious isn't it they are the microcosm of the culture mm. and so you are actually working with the very basis of that world that country and all so different you know the way anyway so yes yeah, so i had this <clears throat> so I went off to Canada and because it was nationally endowed, this wonderful place, Banff, you know, it was one musicians could go there and they had their own mu music cells where they could compose. I mean, it was really, and for writers and for theatre, it was a real arts and lovely surroundings you know, in woods and things. Oh, just, you know, with the mountains and the glaciers all near. And it was just fabulous. Lots of mosquitoes too. And a swimming pool, a nice place, you know, nice little flats for everybody. It was kind of wonderful. And, but I had to, in order to qualify, you had to cast in every province. You had to go and audition actors from every province of Canada. So in a freezing, freezing February, I think it is, I <clears throat> and this wonderful woman called Patricia Hamilton, who had been a student, an actress at Carnegie Mellon when I was training there. I think she was a year above me and I thought was very talented and in fact was part of my Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park company. She'd started, I mean, she had a very good career through her life as an actress, but she also started doing a sort of producing because she felt that actors didn't have nearly enough time to work properly, rehearsals were too short, and she tried to create good conditions in which actors could have longer to work and work with good directors, and she brought directors from abroad, and then <clears throat> she was subsumed by um, Banff, and that became a nicer home for because she was more financially based, so I went there to do Blood Wedding, <clears throat> and the two of us had to, you know, make this journey across Canada 
you know, going from Nova, no, the one place we didn't go to was Nova Scotia. We went to Montreal, we went all over the place, you know, um, auditioning. And I, I remember in uh, Winnipeg, which is, I think, the, one of the coldest places in the world, coming out of the airport and practically dying of the cold. And we had to walk, I think, about five minutes to wherever we were auditioning people. And we gathered together a cast from all over the country. And I was there for six to eight weeks, you know, in this very comfortable surroundings. And I did um, Blood Wedding there. There was a nice production and I've got a video of it. It's the only thing. And when I looked at that video years later, it looked like somebody else's work. It didn't. I thought, oh, is that me? It looks like some European director. It was very interesting. And that transferred to a very nice theatre in, in, in um, Toronto called the Tarragon Theatre for an extra run in the autumn. And I had done work for one other production for her as well until I'd done a Marivaux play for her two or three years earlier. So, um, so I did that and then from there I went to um, China and I did a production of uh, um, Streetcar Named Desire in a city called Tianjin, it's northeast of Beijing, it's the third biggest city after Shanghai. Um, and I was in a very nice new hotel they were building at the time. And I learned to work with Chinese actors we can talk about. And that was a wonderful experience, you know, because I it was like a world where I recognised nothing. Even when the actors did, did warm-ups, they, they did things that were totally different. Anyway, we can talk, if you want to, we can always talk about that, because really interesting. And then <clears throat> this was organised by the UK China Association. It was, in, you know, sort of arts and cultural organisation. It's very well funded, very well supported. And they gave me a few a week in uh, Hong Kong as a sort of holiday afterwards, which was very nice. <clears throat> I then went to Australia and worked in Melbourne. I, I did, uh, what did I do in, I, no, Melbourne was wonderful. I did an eight week workshop of my whole rehearsal process. And that was, again, just a glorious experience. And I can talk about that. I had eight directors and each brought two actors with them. And we worked on both the Seagull and they all brought scenes in as well from different plays and we worked on those and I taught them everything I knew and it was just lovely and I'm still in contact with some of those directors now. Really, that was very rewarding. Mm. And it was a good recuper recuperation, convalescence from the National, all this. And then I went to New Zealand, to Wellington, and did sort of the same thing, but in a much shorter time. I had, I think, a two-week workshop, which was very nice. And then, as a gift, they sent me to the South Island, and I stayed for a few days in a sort of spa place. It was, you know, those were the days. And I travelled business class, and I travelled twice by first class. I was upgraded all the time. And then I came back by the United States, where I went to visit my mother, who lived in Los Angeles. So I was away for about nine months. OK, Mike, well, why don't we... Why don't we go back on the China thing? Because you worked in China more than once, haven't you? I did, yes. I worked. I so later. expand on, on that experience of working in China. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to get your head around the idea of doing a streetcar named Design. I know. Um, I'd rather leave it, actually. Okay. Do you mind? Let me do the front okay. together because my head's on my traje trajectory of where I'm going. Okay. You know, so let's put it aside because it's a whole other subject in a way, you know, working abroad, sort of what links actors together and what separates them culturally and so forth. Very interesting. Yeah. No, it's a very moving experience, but I, but I need to actually gather my thoughts because it hasn't been close to me. So anyway, so I came back to London and there was no work. I hadn't planned any work. There was nothing. And I suddenly felt absolutely persona non grata and while I'd been away a director called Richard Jones had done a production at the Old Vic of an Ossowski play called Too Clever, Too Clever by Half and it got wonderful reviews and he was the taste of the month and a lot of young directors had come out and this I was about how old was I about 54 55 something like that and I thought it's happened you're passe there's a whole generation and I, it was a so 
to cut this very short, there was a period when I got very depressed. Ian McKellen was going to do two, two plays in the National again. They were looking for a director. They were doing Richard II and Leah, I think. Would I like to do one of them? And I, Richard III and Leah. And I said, yes. And then I remember getting a phone call from him saying, we've decided to choose so-and-so, sorry. And I felt as though somebody had kicked me in my stomach. I can't, I can't tell you the reaction to that. Now, he hasn't promised, you know, but uh, it was a very bad, dark period. But it was also similar to a period I'd had when I'd come back from America and wasn't working and before I worked at Lambda, where I was living in a bed sit thinking, looking at my head, myself in the mirror and saying, you're going bald and your life is over at 27, literally. Until I had a very extraordinary, I, I levitated out of myself one day and I'm not a spiritual person at all, but I was lying on my couch bed in my bed sit with a, with a copy of Herman Hesse's The Bead Game in my hand. I was lying there feeling very, and I suddenly, I, all I can say is I levitated out of myself and I was on the ceiling, my back was touching the ceiling and I was looking at myself and saying, you pathetic, stupid, self-indulgent wimp, you asshole, look at you, aren't you ashamed of yourself? And all I can tell you, the next day I started to get some work. Mm. And I don't know, it was, it was extraordinary. I, I, I remember the sensation, I saw myself. And luckily I thought, well, thank God, I, when I'm down, there's something which pulls me back. And so I'm saying this because when I came back and suddenly had no work, after running at the National and having a very successful company, I said to myself, you will not let yourself get that depressed again. You've got to pull yourself out. And I did go and have a little bit of therapy for a while, but I, I got offered some work in Israel, so I went back and did ghosts for a theatre in Beersheba, in Beersheba, Beersheba. And um, then I thought, just go with it. Stop trying to be in control. Just go do anything. So I, I taught designers um, through a very complicated and unexpected way. I got to do some workshops with some BA uh, cabin crew. Somebody in their wisdom had seen some connection between actors and cabin crew. They come out of the, um, what you call the kitchen, the, what do you call them, boat kitchen? Galley, is it? Galley. Yes, in their costumes, and they have their props, and they have their lines, and they have so forth. So I did a few, and initially they all came, they had to give their days up to come, and they were very sort of suspicious. But I got on the side because I said to them, you know, I can imagine what it's like. You're always having to leave home. I said, actors do that as well. And it's awful, isn't it? And how do you adjust? So immediately I got their sympathy. And then I said, do you have people at BA who um, look after your physical well-being? Like you're always having to lift the baggages and push those trolleys. No, nobody does anything. And I said, well, they really should because blah, 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 blah. So, uh, so that was quite nice. And then I thought it'd be wonderful if I got some, a couple of my actors to be to be passengers so we did a workshop it was wonderful pam came and, and philip voss and somebody else and i'd give them all secret uh, um, sort of intentions objectives like um i want to be left alone totally or i want to be get a lot of attention they didn't they never said it and i'd say to the <laughs> the cabin crew try to find out what they want and there was one woman she, must, she was very experienced, she must have been maybe 50s. She, every time she just got it, she was fantastic. So that was very nice, that was all very encouraging. And then BA, because they do, th you know, everything's huge. They decided it was, you know, it was extravagant to have 10 people coming. We had to do it 100. And I thought, oh God, I said, it's, so what I had to do was get, get a, some of my actors and we'd have to divide them up into bubbles, I suppose, as they say now. And they took over a hotel for a day. And I have to say, I, I got paid for that one day more than I think I've paid for a year somewhere else, you know, I mean, but it didn't work because not all the actors could deal with them. And because there were a lot of them, they got very shirty. And I don't know how we're doing this and this is all nonsense and so forth. And it sort of died out. But 
before that, they'd sent me down to um, Heathrow to observe their classes and how they trained them. And that was really quite interesting, you know. So that was an experience which I didn't expect to have. And so I just did whatever came along. I thought, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be proud. You know, this is a reality, get on with it. And then uh, Cambridge Theatre Company was looking for a new director. And I, in those days, the Arts Council had wonderful people who were, who were looking after their clients. And they became your friends and they were, I mean, it's, a, it's nothing like that now. It's totally depersonalized. I mean, it was lovely. And I used to keep in touch with them. And there was a wonderful woman called Jean Bullwinkle, maybe, something like that. It was so nice. She said, hey, Mike, uh, Cambridge Theatre Company's up. Why don't you apply? And I thought, oh, another company. And I sort of didn't think about it too much because I sort of clutched at it. It seemed like a very good idea, but it was a very different, it was a touring company, but, but it was a middle scale, rather with a very conventional audience, mainly Southern English, small towns, you know, where they go because they have nice meals, home cooking before the show. And they're used to seeing, you know, nice plays with nice sets and telly names. And I was really, you know, a square peg in a round hole. But it took me a long time to realise that. And so off I... And I tried to do, give them what they want. I started off doing four English comedies. You know, Lady Windermere, Arms and the Man, um, uh, Country Wife, and, so, and one other. I can't remember. Oh, oh, Twelfth Night. And I had some guest directors. And... Anyway, I got the job, yes, I went and I was interviewed and I was welcomed with great enthusiasm. And so that's the next slot, actually. Mm. Okay, good. Is that, and that becomes the company that's called Method Madness. Uh, yes, that's right, yes. Okay. Yeah, which was another very different sort of thing. So, oh my God. <laughs> trouble is, PDC, as I talk, suddenly I remember something I'd totally forgotten about, connected, you know. I mean, it's doing me a lot of good. I hope it's good for you because I'm so, it's making sense of lots of things and I'm seeing things much more objectively and seeing threads really, really interesting. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll bring, this, um, we'll bring this segment to a close then and uh, we'll reconvene in a while. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that chat. And if you did, would you press the like button and also um, the uh, the subscribe button that would be great and if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening just press the bell button um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here underneath the video please do and at some point I will um, re-interview Mike as it were and put some of these questions to him so um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.